just a kid. You're making a big mistake. I'm not taking advice from you. You're an outlaw. Leave me alone. Please. Arthur awoke from his sleep in a cold sweat, frantically recalling all of the nightmares that had just plagued his rest for hours. Nightmares that had felt so real, so vivid, that he began to question whether or not they were only nightmares at all. Were they memories? Premonitions? He didn't know. But what he did know is that he felt like shit. It had been a rough and broken sleep, and to call it sleep at all would really be a stretch in itself. I mean, sure, Arthur was technically in bed until midday, but he was more than ready to jump straight back in and take a nap before his day had even started. But of course, he didn't, because the nightmares had not only provided him with a horrible rest, but they'd also provided him with a new sense of urgency. You see, the nightmares had called him to three specific locations around the West, the first of which was a house in Valentine that he immediately recognized. And he didn't know why, but he needed to be there. So the boys packed up and began their trip into Valentine. Frank told Arthur about his weird dream he had, where Arthur couldn't stop coughing for some reason, and before long, they arrived at the house. After having a gun pointed his way by an insane old woman, Arthur wasn't surprised to see Mary come to the door. Because, well, this was her house. They chatted for a while, taking a minute to reminisce on old times, but Arthur's sense of urgency was not a false alarm, as his calling to Mary's home was actually in perfect timing. You see, her little brother had apparently run away with a group of radical copycats of Western Jesus. Twisted morals, no lassos, and horses with names like Hank, Dank, and Stank. The life of being a savior to literally all of mankind was not a safe one, especially not when being led by a bunch of phonies. And so Arthur agreed that getting Mary's brother Jamie to come home was definitely necessary, especially after those dreams he'd just had. So our boys made a trip to the Phonolonians' camp and began trying desperately to get Jamie to return. But he wasn't going to come quietly. He was much too faithful in these false prophets by the time the boys arrived. And so in protest, he took off on his dollar store Frank. Now I say this every time, but as usual, the first attempts for any mission pretty much go about the same. I was just playing through, getting a feel for what may cause a problem in our quest to kill no one. And this was merely a chase mission, so I wasn't really worried at all. And for once, I was actually right in not feeling worried about a seemingly forced knockout or kill. But that didn't mean I was about to get off scot-free. If you've seen any past episodes of this series before this one, you'd know that the primary mission of these videos has always been to avoid kills as much as possible. Knockouts suck, but as long as we try our best to get the absolute minimum in each situation, we've been good with that. We can deal with a couple of punch-ons. But in terms of using a gun, a gat, a boomstick, if you will, that has so far been uncharted territory. We have been very determined to avoid that as well. And here was surprisingly the first instance that threatened that goal. So here's the short of the situation. Mary's brother Jamie would rather die than go back home. I don't wanna live anymore. Is Mary a bad cook? Is the neighbor's dog too loud at night? Who knows? But regardless, shooting himself in the head was apparently preferable to whatever the alternative was. He needs some medical assistance. And the game wants us to use a bang bang to disarm his boom boom, thus saving his life. And that's great. I mean, Arthur is all for saving lives. He's done it for bruh, five episodes bruh. straight at this point, bruh, but bruh. did we have to use a gun to do it? Was I gonna dedicate an unholy amount of time trying to avoid it regardless? But I'm gonna get straight to the point here because waiting out the time absolutely 
doesn't work. I tried multiple times, it's a sewer slide no matter what. So I reloaded the save, went back to where I was just before the mission started, and instead of listening to the Phonolonian speak, I chose the disrespectful dialogue options instead to see if it would alter what happens with Jamie's chase. Are you always this negative and antagonistic, sir? Bro, I'll tell you what, you fat little cunt. It didn't, and all it did was give me the option to throttle the old man. I, I didn't want to know what happens if I hit triangle here, so I once again reloaded my save to start fresh. So the chase was obviously unavoidable, I expected that going into this, but what if I could somehow intercept Jamie before he got to the train line? The train line was where all of our problems began, so could I maybe get him to fall off of his horse and avoid it completely? That was my next plan of action, but with Jamie so obviously scripted to be faster than Arthur and Frank, how was I possibly going to get close enough to knock him off? I played through the chase a few times and eventually found a point of interception right there. You see, when Jamie turns left here into the cornfields, I would instead turn right to try and cut him off, hopefully ending in a collision that would knock Jamie off of his horse and help us to avoid using a gun. In the moments I was trying to intercept Jamie, it was kind of fun to look for ways to cut him off with just the right timing. I mean, it didn't work at all, time and time again, but in my head, this was a potentially simple solution for our big problem. What I'm trying to say is it wasn't grueling like some of the other missions had been. It was chill, it felt kind of systematic, but I slowly began to realize it was pointless. Now don't get me wrong, I still tried for a very long time regardless, but even if you absolutely no question at all beat Jamie to the interception point, he's scripted to just zoom right past you. And even if he did somehow get knocked from his horse, the chances of it allowing us to completely avoid this section of the mission were slim to non-existent. I mean, the most I could really see happening even if we succeeded in knocking Jamie over would be a mission failure. It just made no sense that this would allow us to skip a portion of the mission. So while I was determined to not use a weapon for sure, and still will go on to avoid it as much as I can, it was dumber than usual of me to continue trying something so obviously futile. And at the end of the day, if using the forbidden boomstick was absolutely the only way to save a life, I know for certain that our boy would do it. Ah, that was fucking silly, wasn't it, mate? After rescuing Mary's brother from himself, Arthur needed to move on to the next point of interest his dreams had alerted him to. Location number two was none other than the home of Thomas Downs, who was quite well known around the West for his random and unprovoked acts of violence. Now again, Arthur's dream hadn't really given him too much information as to why he had to visit, but he felt a strong sense of urgency regardless. Arthur decided speaking to Thomas would obviously be a good place to start, but rather than being met with friendly conversation, he was instead met with one of Tom's signature outbursts. Now, despite being attacked first, Arthur had no interest in retaliating, especially if it could be avoided. But of course, as always, the game had other plans, and continued prompting us to break every single bone in this fragile man's body. And I mean, look, even though beating Thomas up wouldn't result in a kill or a knockout technically, I still didn't want to beat him senseless for the sake of Arthur's good name. And while it seemed unavoidable at first, eventually I discovered you can get Thomas to move around, and even avoid beating him up completely by simply pressing triangle to pick him up, and put him back down. You could argue this might have caused him a bruised tailbone at the very least, but whatever injuries he has once the cutscene activates clearly had nothing to do with Arthur. Oh shit, what is that? Now it seemed as if that was that, a simple task for Arthur that was prompted by a random dream that meant nothing. But as Arthur began to lecture Thomas about his random acts of violence, he was cut off by a phrase that completely caught him off guard. You know, it's funny that you came here today, Thomas said. A man in my dream told me you would. Told me you've been off trying to undo all of his work. He didn't sound happy at all. I think you've made a bad enemy, Arthur. Real bad. Said it's about time the fun was over. And it was about time that he gave you this. Understand. <laughs> Thomas coughed 
in Arthur's face, which was definitely very rude, but Arthur really didn't think much of it. Uncle told countless stories about angry men in his dreams before burping what was left of his whiskey into someone's face, and they'd never come off with anything worse than a bad mood. So while it was weird that his dreams had led him to Thomas for seemingly no other reason, if there really was someone out there trying to get rid of him, he knew they'd have to do a lot better than one measly cough. Arthur's dreams showed him a vision of one final location, but there was something about this one in particular that really rustled his jimmies. This one had bad news written all over it, like in permanent marker and shit. And as they got closer to their destination, even Frank began to seem spooked. What if Thomas wasn't bluffing? What if the boys were in more danger than what Arthur had let himself believe? Who was the enemy that Thomas mentioned? The endless stream of questions going through Arthur's mind would have to wait, as they'd arrive to where the dream had sent them. Javier and Charles observed the town of Blackwater, as they explained the situation they were currently facing. They also questioned how the hell Arthur knew where to find them, but Arthur brushed it off as merely a coincidence. The explanation was cut short, however, as Trelawney arrived and informed them of the little time they had to act. But Frank and Arthur understood just how dire the situation was. Arthur's good friend Sean had been snatched up by some remaining members of Strawberry Security for public urination. The absolute worst and most punishable crime in the West, but only for alcoholics of his level. You see, the legal system is complicated in the West, but the charge of public urination for him is instead charged as a major environmental violation due to the sheer potency of his, you know. So he, of course, had been sentenced to death. And as we all know by now, our boys would of course be looking to prevent that. So off they went. Now this mission started with us scoping out the guards that were taking Sean to where he would be executed. And I always like to point out what I was thinking and how I was feeling about a certain mission while going into it. So for this one, I can safely say I was shitting my pants. This one was a worry because I remembered this mission quite well. And the first thing that had me pretty concerned were these initial two enemies that we would stealth kill if we were playing the game regularly. But as you already know, we aren't playing the game regularly, we're playing the game torturously. So, as I slowly approached the guards alongside Javier, I braced myself for whatever challenges this mission would bring. So, as usual, my default solution to every obstacle in this game was to throw a piece of rope at it. And to my surprise, the mission didn't fail for blowing our cover. Instead, Trelawney laid on his back and had a seizure while Javier stabbed the first enemy and shot the second that I had restrained. And to top off the outstanding luck that I had just experienced, the rest of the guards in the area hadn't been alerted. This didn't have the chance to work in my favour, however, as stealth in Rockstar Games makes absolute shit sense, but I already knew the canyon shootout was unavoidable. I had a pretty good idea of how this played out in a regular setting for my last playthrough. But I of course had no idea what I was in for in terms of killing no one. I had no idea how capable or incapable Javier would be either. For some reason though, right from the beginning of this mission, I had a super bad feeling that we were in for something horrible. It just, for some reason, I can't put my finger on it, but it just reminded me of how I felt going into the first couple of attempts in episode 2. I mean, we've had challenges since then for sure, you know, the conductor on the train had me hopeless for hours, the fight in the saloon had me wanting to put myself through my bedroom wall, and having Micah completely freeze in the final section of his rescue definitely wasn't the easiest to find a solution for either. But nothing, and I mean not a thing, has even come close to the brutal difficulty of episode 2. And we were just lucky back then that Micah had stepped in and saved us. But Micah wasn't here to help us now. He needed time to help himself. And so if things turned sour, the weight would be far greater than ever before. So I started off my attempts here by sort of breaking down the structure of this mission. And so far I could split it into three main sections. We had the takedown here that could be avoided by just lassoing one of the enemies. We had the first three attacking enemies here, which could be killed by Javier as long as you were active enough with the lasso. 
And then finally, there was the open field full of enemies shooting from various pieces of cover at various different heights. This was, you know, pretty much hell on earth. I mean, you pop up for two seconds and go back into cover full of holes and missing half an ear. Restraining the enemies was manageable, but it definitely wasn't easy. I had to take it slow, I had to get a feel for which enemies could be killed and which enemies needed to be restrained, but the constant barrage of bullets made it very difficult to stay out in the open long enough to tie someone up. But honestly, even after just a couple of attempts, I mean, it had gone quite well so far. Once you progress far enough into the third section, more enemies come riding in on horses, but Javier is more than capable to dead-eye the shit out of them before they even have the chance to attack. So here I am, weary, but pretty damn happy with the results so far. Here I was thinking this mission was gonna be all stinky and difficult, when in reality, all there was left to do was to wait for Javier to take out these last two enemies. Bang! Cliff Boy down. Boom! Charles bonks Cliff Boy number two over the head. One measly Cliff Dweller remains and I was ready to run up the rocks and restrain him myself. I was feeling confident. I shouldn't have felt confident. It just makes the pain more painy, the hurt more hurty, and I don't know why I do this to myself every single time. I honestly think the false confidence going into these missions kind of, you know, keeps me going, but this is where the problems really started rolling in. So basically, I wanted to run up the rocks here and restrain this dude quite quickly because not only was Javier having real trouble hitting anything besides the rock he was sitting behind, but I also knew that too much inactivity from me would result in his death. An important thing to remember for this mission is that if Javier dies or the mission fails, it means going all the way back to square one. So I began running up this hill in hopes that Javier would follow me, regardless of the remaining enemy on the cliff. <laughs> so just like that, we were back to square one. And I regrettably have to inform you that this was the first of many, many returns to square one. I'm about to say something similar to what I said in episode 2 that I haven't had to say in any other episode since. But there were so many, so, so many attempts at this mission that I couldn't even fit majority of all the important stuff that happened in these attempts without the video being longer than the time I cried for while making it. You know, on this channel, we always joke about me uh, slowly going insane from the sheer difficulty of this challenge, but uh, yeah, this one. This is the one. I, I I think this one got me. Now I apologize if I skim over a lot of this way too quickly, but I'm gonna try and condense this absolute behemoth of a crusade into just the important details. So that first little failure where I ran up the hill was frustrating, for sure, but it wasn't exactly the moment that made me want to do an Olympic dive into a vat of skin-eating acid. No, that came a few attempts later when I realized that, hey, dumbass, getting too far away from Javier is going to fail you every single time. So running up the hill was basically a no-go. Now keeping in mind that every mission fail meant going right back to the start of the mission and painstakingly making my way through each wave in a non-lethal fashion, I was already kind of losing my mind. Really it was because each attempt felt like it carried so much weight, just because one little mistake meant a complete undoing of my progress. So as my sanity dwindled, I decided that maybe my best course of action would be to deal with this cliffside enemy directly rather than just trying to avoid him. And although it looked possible, running up these rocks and getting to his level in the first place was in fact the opposite. Each attempt to get up resulted in sliding right back down and so I thought I would take the risk of trying to lasso the enemy down from the cliff despite the chance I could accidentally kill him from the fall. This was also not an option, however, as the crosshair couldn't be aimed that high. Turns out that rope that Arthur uses is a lot heavier than what it looks. So now I'm thinking, 
Now what? Where could we possibly go from here? Javier can't kill this enemy because the player is scripted to do it. We can't run away because Javier can't be abandoned and refuses to follow. We can't run up the embankment to restrain him and we can't risk lassoing him down because Arthur's lasso weighs a fucking metric ton. Ready to lose my mind, but not quite ready to give up, I decided I would spend many, many attempts trying to run up that embankment regardless, as getting onto the cliff would allow me to restrain him and put an end to this soul-crushing madness. Did I ever tell you what the definition of insanity is? Insanity is doing the exact same fucking thing over and over again, expecting shit to change. But for some reason, I kept running up that embankment. Something told me that this was the way. I mean, that something was clearly telling fibs, but I was brain dead enough to believe it. I tried and tried and tried with absolutely no progress in getting up this embankment, until one measly development gave me the slightest will to continue. Because of the way that physics work in this game, attacking the embankment at a slightly different angle would unlock Arthur's temporary ability of falling in style. Now this was good news because utilizing this flaw in the physics meant that I had the opportunity to reach the enemy after all. The bad news, however, was this also gave me yet another way to die and lose all of my progress. This embankment doubled as my new home and also my new burial site. I spent attempt after attempt running up the embankment, almost making it and dying as a result. I even got so fed up with it for a second there that I desperately returned to the original hill with the new goal of being quick enough to drop down onto the cliff from behind. I went through an interesting phase of completely abandoning the path you're meant to approach the mission from, in hopes that I could at least get back to where I was at a faster rate. Because right now, honestly, that's what was really destroying my brain. The constant loss of progress was killing me. I did end up finding a pretty cool route that worked, but I wasted the first opportunity to use it on yet another desperate trip up the hill. Probably worth mentioning, I also failed this jump a lot. So this was when I decided to make a drastic change, and it even came with its own slogan. You can't lose progress if you never make progress. As I said, restarting the mission and fighting all the way back through all of the enemies was currently what was ripping my soul from my body and stomping it into a stain on the pavement the most. So my new solution was to just start bypassing everyone, using every miracle tonic I could to survive, to avoid any combat at all. I needed more time to work on getting up this embankment and less time on getting up to that point in the first place. It really was just a shame that this embankment was also a massive challenge in itself. I went through another phase of trying to approach the mission from another angle by looping around from the right this time. And holy shit, I cannot explain how convinced I was this was about to work. This was progress, the only drop of it I had experienced for a very long time. It was time to complete this godforsaken mission once and for all. I restrained one cliff dweller, and then two cliff dwellers, and all that was left was the final cliff dweller who wasn't there for some reason. And right here was the most heartbroken I had been in the entire series so far. This moment, right here. Arthur was so obviously broken as well that even the enemies gave him the courtesy of not shooting him. Like they were giving him a moment of silence for this absolutely heart-wrenching tragedy. Why did the cliff guy not spawn? Our problems could have been over. Our mission could have been accomplished with zero knockouts and zero kills. But this dude just, what, didn't decide to pull up to work today? Was he late for his fucking shift as an NPC? I mean... I didn't know exactly. That was until I restrained all the enemies, walked down to the beginning of the mission, and was greeted with my reason. This lazy little 
Javier was the trigger for the Cliff Dweller and the trigger for the advancement of the mission as a whole. And so as well as that rock climbing strategy had just worked, it was pointless without Javier, as we needed to be close by him for him to continue pushing through the enemies. A day or so later, I returned to my attempts with more of the same thing. That of course meant being met with the same result every time. I tried getting Javier to run all the way up before returning to the waterfall to maybe try the rock climbing strategy again, but the limit to how far you can go once the cliff dwellers are triggered is severely shortened. I don't even need to say how frustrated I was, how out of ideas I was, because I'm sure everything leading up to this point has emphasized it enough. But honestly, I've got to say, the only saving grace that kept me going back was that damn embankment. It was calling out to me on every attempt. Isaiah, try running on me again. It'll have a different outcome, I promise you're not going crazy. I was going crazy. And with such impaired judgement, I went right back to it. I don't know how many times I ran up and down that embankment, but you'd think at this point I would have been an absolute expert. But I can assure you that I definitely wasn't. So when I did finally run up it successfully, the sheer luck shocked me beyond belief. You see, now you're probably thinking, Isaiah, why are you not making a bigger deal of this? I mean, why are you not more hyped? You literally just made it to where you needed to be. The pain was over. Pack it up. You made it. Now, this is where I would typically say I'd hit rock bottom, where I would usually announce that I had officially lost all hope. And I guess to some extent, both of those statements were true. Not only was it looking like I couldn't restrain this enemy, but it was also looking more and more like I would have to shoot him. See, I actually ended up making it to the top of that embankment a few more times after that, but moving over even just a little bit to restrain him seemed to result in Javier's death no matter what. And, you know, I had one final plan, but it quickly became impossible for me to even get back there in all the attempts that followed. This mission had gone far beyond grueling already. It was much more than that. But I did not want this mission to end with Arthur shooting and potentially killing his first enemy. I did not want his life mission to go down the drain like that. But this was the longest time I had made no progress in this entire series so far. Really, not a single proper step forward since this mission began. But that is when everything took a very, very unexpected turn. This is very important. I approached this mission the same way I had countless times before, bypassing the enemies and making a break for the first active wave. I restrained one, the other was shot mid-tackle, and I was forced to retreat as the enemy's fire was proving too much. Again, before we continue, this had happened hundreds of times. Javier killed the next couple of enemies with ease and I moved forward, expecting the same barrage of attacks I had received time and time again. But now, the only bullets flying were those from Javier and the final cliff dweller. Every other enemy stood completely still, not a single one of them fired. It was almost as if they'd all gained a newfound respect for Western Jesus and his mission. There was no other way to explain it. I mean, we'd seen this briefly before when I attempted the rock climbing strategy, but I had absolutely no clue what triggered this. It was like seeing a crowd of sworn enemies that were about to go to war just suddenly embrace the one they'd been hell-bent on destroying. And while this didn't exactly solve our main problem, I definitely wasn't complaining. Every single one of them stood still as Arthur restrained them. And before long, there was only one last obstacle that stood in our way. One last enemy that refused to let us pass. I'll get you, bitch! I ran directly for the embankment, completely overshot the platform I wanted to land on and half expected to fall once again to my death, but I landed safely on the rock below. I was extremely careful not to move too far forward or jump onto his level at all, as it had caused a mission failure multiple times at this point. And although it meant potentially throwing away this perfect opportunity that had come out of nowhere, I knew what I had to do. Even if it meant attempting this 500 more times, I knew that I had to risk it all 
to have a chance. I got as close as I possibly could, carefully lined up my throw, and let it go. Right there, I thought I'd lost him. But the cliff dweller survived and teetered dangerously close to a much larger drop. I didn't think that I would get this far and so any fragment of a plan I had was swiftly thrown out the window. I looked around quickly to search for an out, but it was too late. I'm narrating this way after the fact and still have absolutely no idea how to explain the relief once he moved. Everything about that attempt for some reason had gone perfectly. And after looking back at all of the recordings, I still have no fucking clue why none of the enemies attacked. The game just broke out of nowhere. I, d I don't even know what to say, but I couldn't be more thankful. Anyway. <clears throat> Western Jesus finally apprehended the powerful Cliff Dweller and put an end to his reign of pain and suffering. But he was not the only demon that Arthur had defeated that day, as the countless obstacles he had encountered along the way were equivalent to that of a million demons. Arthur was leaving that canyon a different man, a stronger man. But the mission was not yet over as Sean's life was still very much in danger. Two more enemies came barreling out of cover, this time a lot less friendly. Arthur restrained the both of them as Javier sat back and Charles rushed in from the background pretending like he hadn't just stood there for days doing absolutely nothing. It was time for the final standoff. The last wave of enemies that not only threatened the life of Arthur's friend, but would also decide the fate of this mission. With Arthur, Javier and Charles finally working in unison, and Frank still down by the river catching up on some sleep, the battle waged on. I decided to take the long way around and flank the enemies, moving in to restrain them as the boys fired from cover. Enemy after enemy was left tied up before another wave came charging out of the forest, only to be driven right back in a matter of seconds. And it finally sunk in that we'd actually done it when Sean was cut free from his bounds. You're a lot less ugly from that other angle, Arthur. All was calm for the first time in what felt like forever. The mission had been successful. Not a single life was taken at the hands of our boys, and yet Arthur couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't right. Something about those dreams that led him into these positions just didn't seem right. Something about these encounters felt unnaturally sinister. And as everyone celebrated the safe return of Sean at the hands of the goodest boys, Arthur began to second guess the legitimacy of the threats that Thomas Downs had given him. Thank you.